So uh, it's my pleasure to now introduce the beginning of the reading cycle, Parashah Bereshit. We start at the beginning of Genesis, and the message today is called Generation Celebration. We're going to learn to not only read genealogies, but learn to love and really understand why they're probably one of the most celebrated texts in the scriptures. Begin our reading from the Torah, Genesis 2, 4 through 9. And I'm going to be <clears throat> reading with a Boston accent, so if you don't understand me, you can just read along. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused the terrain on the land and there was no man to work the ground and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our half Torah reading is from Isaiah 42, 5 through 8. You'll understand why of the connection right from the beginning of uh, the reading. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out who spread out the earth and what comes from it, and who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring up the prisoners from the dungeon and from the prison of those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other nor my praise to carved idols. A wonderful right from the beginning of the first half Torah reading and the cycle, obviously, you can see. It opens to, um, to the understanding of who the Messiah is going to be. And now the Brit Hadashah New Testament reading, uh, first chapter of Matthew. And you'll see why when we begin reading, but this is the genealogy of Yeshua. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadad, and Aminadad, Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Roabam. And Roabam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asaph. And Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jotham. And Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos. And Amos, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. And Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, the father of Abuad. And Abuad, the father of Elakim and Elakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zedek, and Zedek, the father of Echem, and Echem, the father of Eliad, and Eliad, the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Yeshua was born, who was called Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the de deportation to Babylon, to the Messiah, 14 generations. There you go, the whole genealogy of Yeshua. And what's, what's, what's 
interesting is um, as we read the genealogies, <clears throat> you know, we start off the beginning of Genesis and, you know, words are how we communicate. That's why we read. That's why, you know, we have, uh, you know, the, the scriptures. And this is how we communicate. We've gone from grunting to verbalizing to then creating a vocabulary. And then when you create a vocabulary, you have to have kind of uh, principles, procedures, and the laws of languages. So, for example, usually in Hebrew, you have a male noun with a male verb or a plural noun with plural verbs. We don't generally have as much of that in the English language. We don't have male nouns that have to have a male verb, okay? So you can see that different languages have different, different procedures, okay? And then when it comes to deciphering words in English, you know, there's kind of some very interesting insights which I thought I would share with you. So a homonym. A homonym means that a word can mean different things even though it's the same word. So for example, the word right. You were right. Or make a right turn at the light. Different, same word, different use. Or how about this one? Access to clean water is a basic human right. So those are called homonyms. Then there's homographs. Uh, Example of a homograph would mean the same word, but used differently and pronounced differently depending on the use. For example, she put a bow on her daughter's hair. Same spelling, B-O-W, but you will bow down. Interesting. So those are called homographs. And then homophones. These are examples of the same words that sound the same but there's different spelling. The best one, what's the theme of really what we're reading about right from the beginning of the scriptures? And right from the beginning of the scriptures, there's a promise of a seed. In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, Zerah. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And the seed will be driven, in a sense, by generations. So the Hebrew word teladot, which means genealogy, generations, a way and a trace in the scriptures, the idea of this promised seed through generations. So this is kind of the word that I want to focus on today. Okay? You know, the ancient editors uh, of Genesis structured the entire book with the phrase, these are the teledote. And in the book of Genesis, it's so profound. We see it in Genesis 2, 5, 6, 10, 11, 11, 25, 36, 37. And teledot generations can either introduce a genealogy or a lot of times they introduce a narrative and they both go together. So it's not just the fact that, you know, we read a whole bunch of, of just names in the genealogy of Yeshua and Matthew, but it's a narrative. And why does the um, Red Hadashah start off with the genealogy? It seems kind of a boring way of starting off a, a book. Because if you want to declare yourself to be the Messiah, the first thing you need to do is declare the fact that you are a dis Jewish and a descendant of King David. So it also tells about a narrative. Today, we're going to celebrate the generations by showing five things. Valuation, the variations of generation, God visits during generations, validations, and then verification. So the first one, generations show valuation. The fact that there's so many genealogies, these are all the references in just Genesis. This is the book of the generations of Adam, the generations of Noah, the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the generations of Shem, generations of Terah who fathered Abram. Isaac and Jacob shows that God values generations, genealogies. He values this. There's so many of it. If it was just one, then I would say then it's not worth even discussing. The fact that there's so many, right? 
from the beginning of the Jewish scriptures means that God values it, we should value it, okay? And then as you keep going, we see that there's a genealogy from Jacob to King David in the book of Ruth, right? And in Psalm 89, I will establish your seed, David, forever and build up your thrones to all generations. So after King David, you want to be the rightful Messiah. You must come from that generation. And then in Numbers 3, these are the records of the generations of Aaron and Moses. And we see we don't just have the generations of the Messiah, but we need generations from the priesthood. You walk into any synagogue and they don't know you, the first question they're gonna ask you is, are you a Kohen? And depending on how you answer that, if yes or no, if it's no, they'll ask, are you a Levite? Ah, those generations, even though we don't have written generations of those today, are still very important for the Jewish people. So you can see there's a great value in the generations. And here we see from Adam, um, down to Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob obviously had 12 sons. And from those 12 sons are the whole lineage of the Jewish people. This is, and we'll look at this later on in our study, but now we have the, from Judah to King David, which is 10 generations. And this try and tracks how we get down to Yeshua. Okay. Generations also show variations. We saw that in Judaism, it's not important just to trace the line of the Messiah or the king. And it's not just important to talk about the lineage of the priesthood, but we also trace <laughs> the genealogies of Abraham's firstborn son, Ishmael, okay? And says, you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. So there's a blessing on Ishmael, but it comes with a warning. He shall be a wild donkey of a man and his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he shall dwell over against all of his kinsmen. His kinsmen is going to be the Jewish people. So there's going to be strife from the garden between the, the, the serpent seed and Eve seed. There's also division between Abraham's seed through Ishmael and Abraham's seed through Isaac. And then it continues because, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two people will come from you. And then one of those will be Esau. Okay, these are the generations of Esau, and Esau is the father of the Edomites, and we're going to see through the scriptures, unfortunately, how a lot, a lot of conflict between the Jewish people just didn't happen through Ishmael, but it also came through Esau as well, and if you read the scriptures, we can look at this later on in our study, Esau, to tick off his father, specifically marries a non kinsman marries the daughter of Ishmael. So I'm glad that the scriptures show the fact that not only the value of the genealogies in the Jewish world, but it does show how the generations, the genealogies of these other people are going to affect the Jewish world and the Jewish history. And we see that through Esau, Amalek came. Amalek was an enemy of the Jewish people. And then if we get down to the bottom here in Esther, after these things, King Ashazerus promoted Haman the Agagite. Okay, so we see in the Jewish world, Ishmael to Esau to Amalek, Amalek to Haman who tried to destroy the Jewish people. So again, generations start a whole narrative that there's gonna be conflict between Jewish people and and their enemies, okay? Generations show visitation, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, I want you to see that the generations have the hand of the Lord on it too. 
because it's not always just the firstborn who carries on the line. God has his hand in this, okay? And we can see right from the beginning of, of um, the scriptures that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, okay? And the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourned to you in a land that is not there. Generation, uh, Genesis 17, and Abram was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram. Not only will the Lord direct these genealogies, he's got to intervene. Why? Abram was 99 years old. Sarah was very, very old, past the age where she could give birth, and yet God visited them and said, don't worry, you will have a son. I promised it to you. So the reality is generations show that the Lord has to intervene sometimes. And then obviously when we get to the New Testament, we see that the Lord had to intervene as well by having a virgin give birth. So generations not only show value, not only shows variation, it actually shows that God's hand is in it by him visiting um, and appearing at certain times to make sure that we know that he's, He's the driving force between, be, behind all of this. Fourth, generations show validation. As we saw, the book of the genealogy of Yeshua the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, why is it important, as I mentioned before, that Matthew starts off with the genealogy of Yeshua? Well, just like anybody, if you want to be the Messiah, if you don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and you want to be the Messiah, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to prove your lineage. That's important because he must be Jewish, son of Abraham, must be from the king line of King David, and right away he has the credentials. Now the New Testament will go on further and show that, you know, he fulfills a whole bunch of prophecies. But the first thing that he has to do, the first thing is validate his generations. And fortunately at that time, everybody had their generations, they had their genealogical lines, and they were held in the temple. When the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, we see that the lineages are all done away with. And today, if you're born Jewish, I don't know my lineage. I know I'm not a Kohen or a Levite because my grandfather would have told us. So in Judaism today, the only tribe that does know their lineage by word of mouth are those derived from, uh, through the Levites. Okay? Everybody else does not know. Okay? And then, and we're going to talk about this later. We're going to talk about the genealogy of Yeshua, but we're going to take a look because if you look in the genealogy, there's a whole bunch of names, but one name pops out at you probably at that time, not as much today, but it's Jeconiah. And there's a curse that's placed on the lineage of Jeconiah. Jeconiah, for the most part, is the last sitting king before the deportation of the Jewish people. They come back from Babylon, there's no sitting king. So he's the last. But look at what Jeremiah writes about him, okay? No man of his descendants will proper, prosper sitting on the throne of David. That seems strange to you? That God says the Messiah must come through the line of King David and later on he puts a curse on Jeconiah so that no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David. This causes a problem. And if you've never heard about the curse of Jeconiah, this is a great time to learn about it. We're going to talk about it in our Bible study. I don't have time to do it today. I just want you to see how important the genealogies are, because, again, in the New Testament, it doesn't veer away for the fact that they have to deal with this. They write it the Jeconiah is in the lineage of Yeshua. Now we have to deal with how do we handle this? And that's one of the things that I love about the scriptures. We have to deal with some very difficult things sometimes, and a lot of them show up 
in the generation. Not only here, but we're going to see that there was actually a curse placed on the line of Jacob and the line um, of Judah right from the beginning. That's why there's a genealogy in the book of Ruth. You don't, never heard about that either? Come to our study afterwards and you'll learn more about that as well. Okay? And we see with the validation that she will bear a son and you shall call his name Yeshua for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken. The reality is, is Yeshua validates what God said right from the God. It's in our Pasha today. Um, even though that I did not speak specifically on Genesis 3, 5 and preach on it, but I did allude to it. Why? Because this is the first understanding of what we call the promise hope. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, the serpent, and her offspring. What's really interesting about that is usually women don't have offspring. It's usually through the man. But there it is in Genesis 3.15. And then on Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So we see, in a sense, Matthew's working back. It fulfills what the prophet says in Isaiah, and then it also fulfills what God first promised in the garden in Genesis 3, 5, 15. Generations show a validation of who a person is, and Yeshua definitely fulfills what God had promised who the Messiah would be. And then finally, generations show verification. And I want to talk about a generation gap. It's a term that some of you probably know, some don't know, but it first came up in the 60s, where the younger generation, now known as baby boomers, me, seemed to go against everything their parents had previously believed in terms of music, values, politics, culture, social, socialists now refer to this as a generation gap. And in Judaism, it really, really had a lot to do with the religion. Why? Because during the time of the 60s and early 70s, guess what happened? A whole bunch of Jewish people embraced Yeshua as their Messiah. That caused a great generation gap between uh, the generation before and the generation that embraced him, because we had never seen that before for a long, long time. Okay. Now, if you're not Jewish and you want to believe in Yeshua, then this is clear of what they're expecting. And this was taken off of uh, Chabad, an ultra-Orthodox um, branch of Judaism that believes in the coming of a Messiah. And if you notice, the messianic redemption will be ushered in by a person, a human leader, a descendant of King David. He must be from the divinic royal dynasty. Ever since the destruction of the Holy Temple, in every generation, there is an individual skin of the house of David. Their understanding of a Messiah is a little bit different than ours. That any generation could bring forth somebody who's so great that they could be the Messiah. We as believers believe God picked one person, but still, you notice, must be from the house of D David. And every generation, there is a skin of the house of David who has the potential. To How are we to identify, and this is taken from Rambam, Maimonides. If we see a Jewish leader who is the study of Torah and is meticulous in his observance of mitzvot, Influence the Jews to follow the ways of the Torah and wages the battle of God, such a person as the presumptive of Mashiach. If that person then rebuilds the temple and facilitates the ingathering of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, then we are certain that he is Mashiach. But there's one problem. Doesn't have to verify that he's from the house of David. You notice there's a tremendous emphasis put on the Davidic house, but in who and how we identify the Mashiach in the future, nothing is said about him showing the credentials. It just presumes that he is, and that's a big presumption, and we're going to talk about that later too, because that's a big presumption. He does all this stuff, 
could that lead the Jewish person and maybe pick in somebody that they think fulfills all of these, but maybe not from the house of David? Interesting thought to think of, okay? So in the Davidic line today, you know, um, how, you know, how does he show it? He doesn't, okay? It says the prophets likewise will foretell the ultimate coming of the Messiah, the descendant of David, and he'll restore the Davidic dynasty. That's great. But how does he prove he's from the house of David? Here, it says in any event, we do not need to be concerned today how the Messiah, son of David, will be identified. Ah, isn't that kind of interesting? He can do all this other stuff, but the fact that he's from the house of David, um, we know it, but we don't really have to be concerned with it. We'll just figure it out. So I hope that you've enjoyed a little bit of our celebration of the generations. Shows value. Why? God values it, we should. Shows variation. Hey, the generations are not perfect. There's what I mean when they're not perfect, they show some very, very difficult things that we have to get around. And it shows variation by showing generations of others. Shows that God visited us um, at times so that his hand was on it. Generations show that Yeshua definitely is validated of being from the house of David. And in the future, generations will show that if you can't verify it, there might be a problem with who you might think the Messiah is. So let me pray and I'll turn it back over to Mike. Avino Malkano, our Father and King, thank you so much for just uh, opening up again to Bereshit in the beginning. Lord, uh, thank you from right from the beginning, you showed us that there would be a promised seed. That promised seed would be tracked and traced through the scriptures and genealogies. Many people just want to read over genealogies and not care about them at all. Yet, they might be the most important piece <laughs> of what we read in the scriptures. They not only show families, but they show Jewish and enemy families. They show a trace of this seed. There's difficulties, and if we look at the Torah, we can get around these, which points to only one person fulfilling all of this. Lord, we thank you for giving us the generations. Most people kind of know their gen genealogy, but they don't know it in detail. Thank you for giving us the details of all of this. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the Messiah down at the particular time and that he could prove that he was Jewish, son of Abraham, and he could prove that he was from the house of David. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your hand being upon all of this and pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.